Hi, my name is Keith Bowes, and I'm the Managing Director of Lotus Resources Limited. Lotus Resources Limited owns the Kalakira Uranium Project. The project is located in Malawi. Uh, the project is a past producer, operated between 2009 and 2014, and Lotus acquired the project of Paladin in March of 2020. We're looking at doing a restart, and we're looking at the uranium price in terms of dictating when we'll be able to restart the asset back up again. Keith, good to see you. Uh, I saw you back in February when you were talking about the uh, resource uh, increase at Kelikera. Um I wanted just a quick catch up because obviously the market's kind of moving, conversations happening, um, you know, a few agreements being signed uh, that we're looking at. Um, I wanted to sort of see where you guys are at. Now, you've recently been in country. You actually were allowed on a plane and visited Malawi. What were you talking about? What were you doing there? That's correct. Yeah, Western Australia opened up its borders and uh, myself and uh, Michael Ball, who's our chief financial officer, were able to travel across to Malawi. Uh, first time in over two years for me to get in country, so that was fantastic. Wow. Yeah. Started off in Joburg and met with some of our engineers and then went up to site. Uh, spent a couple of days on site with our team up there, seeing what was going on, now, having a look at the plant again, having a look at the mine, having a look at the infrastructure and all those types of things, really getting a feel to see whether there'd been any further, say, deterioration, but, you know, was there more work required to bring the asset back online again? I was pleasantly surprised. I think things look really, really great. I'm still confident of the numbers that we've spoken about previously has been in the ballpark for us to restart the asset back up again. I uh, also had the opportunity while I was in the long, we spent almost a week there. We met with the various ministers. We met with um, the Mine Development Agreement, uh, Agreement Committee, which is an important committee. They were looking at renegotiating an agreement that would allow us to restart back up again. And also met with a couple of the utilities as well in terms of their, their importance in us restarting the asset back up again. So let's talk to me about the kind of conversations that you're having with, with, with government. Okay, so you, 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 you've gone there with an agenda, but they've also got an agenda, right? So it's been all quiet on the Western Front for a lot of, well, uranium companies, definitely. Um, and, you know, the governments are looking to you for one, obviously, get things moving again, but in a responsible manner. ESG matters there as, as well as anywhere else. Um, they're looking for jobs, they're looking for revenues, they're looking for, um, it, well, you, t in terms of tax, they're, they're looking for activity. And you, it was a sort of a, a quite muted conversation. You're having to reintroduce yourself, those relationships again, or are they kind of keen keen to get things moving? Yeah, I think they are keen to get things moving. And I mean, even though I haven't been able to get in country our country manager, Dr. Gray Malunga, who was an ex-minister of mines as well in the previous government, um, he's been actively involved in terms of keeping the government and the various committees up to speed and with what we're doing. Theo Keita, who's our general manager on site, has also been very, very active in terms of talking to the various parties, talking to the government, talking to uh, the district commissioner and all those types of people, just so everyone's aware of what we're up to at the moment. One of the things that we've been very, very strong in terms of doing, I think, is actually keeping everyone updated, keeping the communities updated so everybody's aware of what we're doing. Now, as you mentioned, the government, what are they looking for? I mean, obviously, everyone's aware that Malawi is a very, very poor country. They are looking for additional revenues. They're looking for new revenue streams coming through. They're looking for foreign currency coming into the government as well, or coming into the country as well. So they're very, very keen to see us starting up as soon as possible because they do recognize the opportunities that a new mine starts up. They also recognize that we're effectively the leader as well. I mean, there's another three mining companies, international mining companies sitting in Malawi. You've got Makango, you've got Sovereign Metals, and you've also got Globe as well. We're at the front of the pack at the moment. Uh, any agreement that gets signed with us is likely to get rolled onto the other companies as well and in a similar form, I would think. So it's important that we understand what the impact is of the various decisions that they're making. And they also need to understand from our perspective as well, in order for us to be able to raise finances, to be able to start a new project up in Malawi, what are the things that they need to come to the party with? Because we must remember that they are a partner with us. They do own 15% of the project. If we're successful, they're successful, and we're always looking for a win-win you know, situation moving forward, and that's really, really important. And that's what the conversation was focused about, it was focused on how we can work together, what are the things that they're looking for, what are the things that we are looking for, so we can bring Calacara back online as soon as possible. I'm glad you went there, okay, because, you know, the in-country ops team is one thing, you know, broad updates is one thing. 
the guy who's running the company, the guy whose job it is to go and find the capital to bring this thing online, coming and talking to them, is, is another, right? I, I've kind of been in those situations myself. They, so you're, you're saying that um, you, you gave them those assurances that obviously we talk, we'll talk about the feasibility due, due, I think, in July. Due, is it, yeah, July, August, July, something? Yeah. yeah, right, that's what right. yeah. um, We'll talk about that in a second, but you've got to give them assurances that the capital markets are open to you, your company, to the Iranian um, sector more, more broadly, and that you're going to be able to gonna hit certain deadlines. So in terms of those assurances, um, what was the nature of those conversations? Because you know, you've got to have a view on the marketplace. You've got to have a view on your ability to go and, go and get that. So uh, how did those conversations go? Well, so I suppose there's a few things, and we've been extremely open about this, that the restart of Calacara does depend on the uranium price. There's no way that we're going to restart the asset back up li- back online again if the uranium price hasn't, hasn't hit a certain level, or that we're confident that within a relatively short period of time that those levels will, uh, will be reached. And we've been very, very open to both the investors and various conversations I've had about that point. I made exactly the same point to the government as well. Although we're interested in getting this mine back up and running as soon as possible, they must recognize that we need to have a minimum uranium price or a minimum number of contracts signed that would make us profitable so we can then actually distribute the profits that come out of the mine to us, well, to the government, to the people of Malawi, and of course, to our shareholders as well. So that was one of the conversations I had. The other thing is that I try to uh, you know, bring into the conversation was that with regard to getting investment, you know, we are competing against other companies um, in the uranium space. And I suppose from an investor's perspective, we're also competing against other companies in different com- commodity spaces as well. And in order for us to be able to attract the financing, to be able to attract the investors, we need to put our best foot forward. We need to have the best possible project available that's got the best possible returns in a jurisdiction that people are happy with and they can see the government supporting us going forward. And that was really around where the conversation was centered in terms of what are those things that we're looking for and what are the things that they're looking for. So just a, give, give me a sense of that one, because I've just come back from a, a trip around Africa, two, two, done two weeks in there, and we, we, we trotted up to some projects in Namibia too, and we kind of got the assurances that the, the, the government was fully on board and, you know, Everyone knew their, their role, as it were, to make it for foreign direct investment, right? So for Malawi, as you say, you know, relatively poor country, kind of a little bit like Namibia in that sense. Um, what, what's your expectation of what their role is in, you know, selling, selling the story for foreign direct investment to get comfortable? I suppose, I mean, and, and it's a question, I mean, maybe I can start with the other side is, I mean, what questions do I get asked about Malawi? from the various um, investors that I speak to and the various shareholders that I speak to. And the concerns there, they say, well, Malawi sounds like a really nice place, but does it have a mining jurisdiction? Does it have history in mining and all that kind of stuff? And we're open about that. Apart from uh, the Calakera mine that operated for five years, there have been no major mining operations there. There are a number of small coal mines and all that kind of stuff that are there, but they're normally regional or local in terms of their supply was really only Calakera that was an international mine. So my comments or my, you know, when I'm talking to the government, I'm talking about these things, saying the investors are asking me these types of questions. You know, what is an investor looking for? He's looking for a stable jurisdiction. He's looking for confidence that the jurisdiction or the rules or whatever are not going to change suddenly overnight that makes a project that was looking fantastic suddenly overnight turns into something that is no longer economic. So we're looking for things like, and this is part of the discussions, we can normally entertain a stability period with regard to the fiscal regime within a mine development um, agreement. And that fiscal or that stability period, sorry, could be for a period of up to 10 years. And within that 10-year period, we get assured things like the royalty rates, uh, the, um, the, ca- uh, the corporate tax rates, Uh, We look at how things are handled from a withholding tax issue, how tax losses and um, things are handled like that. So those are the points that we're discussing. Now, we are are fortunate in one way in that uh, Paladin had negotiated a mine development previously with the government. So that was signed back in 2008. So there is a sort of framework that we have that we can use to start our negotiations with. And that's where we started off, having a look at those what are the things that are critical to us within that fiscal regime and what is critical to the government? 
Once we understand what we want to negotiate, then, of course, it becomes a lot easier to come to a solution on that. So that's where we sit at the moment. We have presented what we think is a case going forward. The government is reviewing that at the moment, and we're expecting them to provide us some feedback in a fairly short period of time. Uh, you're, you, you're going on another, another road trip shortly. You're off to uh, Canada and, and then down to the US <coughs> to have a few conversations. Well, one, join a conference over there, and, and then two, have conversations with some uh, utilities, presumably. What do you take to those guys? Are you going to be able to give them assurances off the back of the conversations with the Malawian uh, government about, well, what they're going to be able to do for you, um, what you're going to be able to do in country and get in, and get a sense of how quickly you can, you can move, you know, talk about I- I- infrastructure is the burden on you or the burden on the government in terms of get, you know, getting your product to where it needs to be. Because um, those, those conversations will, will, will undoubtedly come up there. Um, you know a lot more since your recent trip in country. So do you feel a bit more certain about um, the outcome of the conversations you can have in North America as a result? I think so. I think, I mean, next, the questions that I'm expected to get asked by the various parties we're going to be seeing over in the US and Canada is in terms of, you know, are you comfortable, com- confident about your restart capital? So as we've always mentioned, 50 million US dollars to be able to refurbish the asset, plus some additional costs associated with things like the ore sorting test work, the connection to the national grid or asset recovery things and all those types of stuff. So are we still confident that, you know, we're a a low cost restart? I think that's going to be the first question uh, uh, that I get asked. And I think, well, I know I'm positive on that because I've been to site recently. I've seen what the plant looks like. I know what needs to be done on the plant in order to be able to bring it back online again. So I think that's one thing. But what, what can, I, can I, if I may interrupt, the Keith, is, you know, the, there are things like, you know, en- energy costs and infrastructure, you know, up to the plant, the st- stuff which is not in your, well, hopefully, I assume not, not not in your um, numbers because there's a, you, you can't, you, you, there's only so much that you, you feel that you need to pay for it. So has the government given you assurances that, you know, the stuff which kind of comes up to your borders will be there when you need it or have got assurances over, like say, you know, energy pricing, water, et cetera? So if we look at the various utilities that are required on site, the water one is not an issue for us. We have more than enough water contained within our existing facility. So I'm, so I'm not concerned about that. The main one about the discussion is really to, is in regard to power. So one of the things we've spoken about is connecting to the national grid. So we know that the power in Malawi is, first of all, relatively cheap. We're talking maybe 10 to 12 US cents per kilowatt hour. We also know that the majority of the power is actually green power because it comes from hydro as well. So from an ESG perspective, that looks really, really good. Now, we were fortunate enough to meet with ESCOM when I was in Malawi. I met with their senior management team over there, and we discussed the requirements. Now, the availability of power at the Karonga substation, which is our closest substation, can probably deliver, we think, about half to maybe 60% of our total power demand. But we recognize that there's work that needs to be done on the substation itself, and there's probably some work that has to be done on the feed side of it as well coming into it. And then we build our own line from the Karonga substation to the mine, which is about 40 to 50 kilometers or something like that. But what the discussions were is that, you know, we recognize in Malawi, maybe ESCOM is going to struggle to raise the capital dollars required for them to do the upgrades to the substation and to the feeder lines coming in. But we presented some alternatives there, and one of them is that we might actually provide some of the funding for them, maybe even manage the contract required to be able to do it. But what what they would then do is uh, provide us with reduced tariffs so that we can recover the capital costs that we have um, expended in terms of the upgrade. So that gives us more confidence in terms of making sure I suppose that it gets done on time and it does, gets done to the cost that we required as well. And I know post those discussions and some very high level things, talking to things like the African bank, you know, development banks and all that kind of stuff, for us to go and raise a number, whatever it happens to be for us to do a refurbishment of the power lines and all that kind of stuff, I reckon that's a really easy thing for a development bank to come in and help us fund as well. So from that perspective, I think it's quite easy. And it's nice that we're that we're part of the solution as well. We're not just handing across a request to the ESCOM utility and saying we need power by such and such a day. We can actually participate in the whole process. 
make sure that it gets done, you know, at the, the time frame that we want to look at and all those types of things. And I think that's positive. I think that's a good thing. And the ESCOM wants to work with us on these types of things. I think I think that's I think that's really important. You know, all these all these these you know de- details are important because in a way you're in a little bit more control there, certainly in terms of timing. The 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 cost of capital, I guess, becomes irrelevant if you because you renegotiate the tariffs. Uh, on, on the energy supply, but it gives you kind of s- certainty. Um, so yeah, I, 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 li- I like that. And um, sorry, I interrupted you. You were kind of mid mid flow about some of the conversations that you expect to be able to have um, in North America. Yes. So my expectation is around the capital costs and all that. I expect to get questions around the operating costs, and we can talk about all the technical work we've done around ore sorting and you know power and acid recovery and all those types of things. Really trying to target. And operating costs of less than thirty dollars per pound. That's where we want to be. A C one or a cash cost of less than thirty dollars per pound. And when you have a look at the cash cost curve out there, that probably puts us up the upper portion of the second quarter, which I think we're in a comfortable position to be able to sit in. So I think that's going to be part of the conversation. The timeline as well. When are we going to be able to start um, delivering uranium into the market? And we've said, you know, depending on price and all that, we're looking at quarter two, twenty twenty four for first shipments to customers. Right. That's realistically soon, I think. I think that's a good, uh, they'll favor that. Yeah, yeah, no, for, for sure. In, in, in terms of, in terms of, you know, next cab off the rank, that, that's, yeah, yeah, you, you, you're definitely at the, well, definitely at the front of the queue there. Um, it, it's really kind of comes back to the question of, um, you know, what, People need to believe of, of you, right? So the low capex, the f- circa fifty million uh, number, that's one of the lowest um, out there. But what, what else? Do, what else do you think that you've got in terms of advantage in the marketplace when you're having conversations with utilities? Because clearly they're not, all, you know, we're not going to want a utility pouring into you. You're going to have lots of different contracts that you're going to need to negotiate. So you need to say to them, not only have we got safe jurisdiction and support of the Malawian government, we've sorted out our, our our energy, our capex is low, relatively quick to production. So you, you can be assured that we should we should certainly be one of the suppliers on your 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 list. But what, what's the kind of pushback you get you get from that? What else do they need to sort of see in place from you? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, when you're a utility and you're trying to enter into a contract or you're talking to prevent do. Um, potential suppliers and all that, it's always risk of supply is always the, the question for them. When you say you're going to deliver whatever it is, 500,000 pounds in 2024, how confident are you of that? I think that's the main question they're going to ask. And I think if we can show them the timeline that we want to work to, we want to show them that we can be a low cost producer. But I think what's also really important to mention is that the mine itself operated for five years. So all the issues that you know greenfield projects have around debottlenecking, commissioning, and all that kind of stuff, the majority of those have already been addressed. So in terms of the ramp up of our project, you know, some people may consider 18 months or two years as being a reasonable time for ramping up a greenfield project. I'm sure we can do better than that in terms of ramping up our production as well, because everything's been trialed and tested before. So I see that being a real positive. So that initial amount that we that we say we're going to put into the market. I think we can be very, very confident that we're going to be able to put that amount into the market. I think that's a really important part of it going forward. I think the other thing that people are going to like, and I mean, this is becoming so important after the Russia and Ukraine issue, is this geopolitical diversification of supply as well. I mean, we're, I mean, we're well out of that issue, well out of that region. We would be a safe supplier of uranium going forward. There is a well-known transport route to get uranium out of uh, Kalakera. I mean, Volfus Bay is the obvious route for us to go through, and that's what Paladin did previously. But there are some other routes that we can be looking at. And we've been working with an international logistics company to have a look at those in terms of how else we can get the product out of the country. So I think that's really, really good. I suppose on the other side of the coin, what am I looking from for the utilities? Well, I want to have a conversation to the utilities to see how can they help a new producer come online again? If they're looking to diversify their supply and all that, maybe they're looking for some really good ESG scores. And I think from an ESG perspective, getting product out of Africa is a really good one because uplifting communities, you know, uh, training, jobs and all that kind of stuff, you know, there's an absolute massive multiple on those that you see in Africa that maybe you don't get in some other jurisdictions. So if we can then provide them with, you know, a diverse supply, a really good ESG in terms of what we're doing with our local communities, 
you know, would they be prepared to negotiate a price that makes it worthwhile for us to start back up again? They seem a shrewd lot. I think what we've seen of them in the last three, four years is they don't give much away. And I'm, I'm like you, I'm kind right. of intrigued to see whether ESG matters uh, to them. It certainly does in terms of funding. We're, we're seeing a lot of um, those conversations that you know, funds are being a bit more demanding of, of um, companies. Uh, miners specifically with regards to um, ESG carbon credits and and, and so forth. Um, the, so can I? I want to go back to something you said there in terms of shipping. Obviously, going from Malawi over to Valvas Bay and in, in uh, Namibia on the on the coast of um, west coast of Namibia, um, established route. But then it brings up that kind of east west question, doesn't it? So Af- Africa was viewed as a kind of you know ch- China repository for all, all things commodity, or as you say, in, in light of Russia Ukraine situation, what the US, one of the largest consumers in the world, um, would be looking for, US utilities would be looking for in terms of um, diversification and um, risk mitigation around uh, s- supply. Um, so do you, do you see your product as a kind of North American destination, hence you know, trotting off to Canada and, and the US? I think so. I think North America is probably our primary focus and North America would be the USA and Canada has been probably our, where we focus most of our attention at the moment. I do believe there's an opportunity to get it into Europe as well. And then we would then look at probably Asia after that, whether that be you know, Japan or China or India you know, we'll have those discussions at that point in time. But certainly from this, you know, where we are at the moment, the majority of our focus is in North America. And from that perspective, it does make some sense to send the material to Walthus Bay because it's obviously a shorter tri- um, shipping route. But also we can send the material to Byra as well, which by road is a lot shorter. And by ship, I don't think it adds a lot of cost onto it anyway, coming around the Cape Horn and all that stuff. So we are looking at various options as well, but we certainly are focused on North America and Europe, at least at this point in time, with regard to contracts moving forward. Right. So, so that's, okay, the surety of supply is, is, is good news. They'll also want to understand what the future looks like for you in terms of, of the scale of the operation. So um, back in April, I think you announced the um, some drill results um, from the Livingstonia um, prospect. So are we going to expect some kind of resource from that at any time soon? Yeah, we will do. So we acquired the Livingstonia tenements. Um, we're talking about Southern Livingstonia now. We previously already held the Northern Livingstonia tenements, but we acquired the Southern ones because there was a historical resource on that, uh, on that tenement. So with the drilling program that you spoke about that we announced to the market back in April was really a bit of QAQC in terms of twin holes, just to check and see whether the, um, you know, the logging, the grades and all that kind of stuff were as per the original or as per the historical uh, resource. We also identified what we thought were some quite easy extensions to the resource that we drilled. And then we also did some significant step out drilling as well more like a greenfield thing, just to try and step out and see how long the, or how far the anomaly extended to the north. So all of those results have come in. Our uh, resource geologists are busy with them at the moment, and we expect to be able to announce a resource for Livingstonia within the next couple of weeks. Okay. But I think what we're trying to do with this, though, is the feasibility study that we're going to be announcing to the market in July is only going to be based on the Calacara resource. So that's the resource that's contained within the existing, uh, well, associated with the existing pit, let's say, contained within our existing mining license. And that we expect to see a sort of a 10 or maybe 11 year life of mine associated with that. What we want to try and demonstrate to the investors is that that's not the end of the project. There is further life there. And whether that comes from further drilling around the Calacara uh, pit or whether it comes from an area like Livingstonia, or also we also continued our exploration work after we uh, finished at Livingstonia in an area called Chilumba, which is about 20 kilometers to the north of Livingstonia, a real greenfields um, uh, exploration program. But again, based on some really interesting radiometric anomalies and geological interpretation that indicated it was very, very similar to Calacara. So we put some drill holes in there as well, and we expect those results in probably the next five to six weeks, depending on the turnaround time at the labs. But again, we want to try and show to the investors, this is not a short life of mine project that's 10 or 11 years. You know, there's another five years or eight years of potential material out there that can be brought into the production schedule later on. Now, we probably won't pursue it that hard, 
I think our focus over the next six months is certainly getting the project ready to be restarted. In the subsequent 12 months over that would be the actual refurbishment of the plant prior to startup. But I would hope we've demonstrated to our shareholders there is potential growth in areas other than just the Calacara for extending our life of mine. It's, it's kind of interesting, actually. I think people forget the scale of some of these African uranium projects. I mean, you, you were talking about, I think, three, three million pounds um, of production, um, and you've got, was it, 38 million pounds in total at the moment, just on Calacara. Um, these are large projects. Your market cap is what, say, three hundred million on, on, on a good day at the moment, right? Um, it compared to some of the North American stories where they're talking about getting back into production million pounds, okay, million pounds, but they've got billion dollar valuations. So, is, does does that kind of skew your thinking in terms of where you want to supply? your products. Do you think so that some connection to the North American markets will help you in terms of valuation, in terms of people's perception of, you know, what it is that uh, you, you, you've you got? It opens up to, are you, in fact, you're not even listed, I think, on the OTC. I know you're ASX, but you're not listed on the OTC Q, Q, QB. Yeah. That's right, the QB. So do you need to kind of step that up in terms of get, kind of get that recognition globally once the kind of market gets going and, you know, utilities are doing con- term contracts? How do you come at that side of things? Because the we, we get we've talked today a lot about how do you get this thing into product, what you've got, how you get this thing into production, how you get product in, in, into market. But in terms of driving that valuation curve, how important is North America to you? That's very important to us, and that's why we did that OTC uh, listing last May. And the OTC listing has actually proven to be very very successful for us. We have actually been able to grow our US or North American retail base quite significantly on on, on the back of that, and we look at pushing that even further. I mean, now that we're able to travel, I mean, going across to Montreal, obviously the primary point of that that, uh, conference is to meet with the other developers, to meet with the utilities, to meet with the traders, to meet with the logistics companies and all that. But we're certainly looking to do more investment roadshows in North America as well, because we know the North Americans are very, very positive in terms of the uranium. They are certainly the ones with the most money to be able to invest in projects like this. We want to be getting that story out there. But I do think there's a couple of things we we need to work on first. I do know that there's a perception out in the market that Calacara was a very expensive operation. We need our feasibility study to come out that has got the things like the ore sorting, that has got the reduced power uh, prices in it, has got the acid recovery in it, has got the improved tailings management systems included in it, so that we can show that we are not a high cost producer and that in fact we can produce at less than $30 per pound, which is our target out of the feasibility study. Once people see those types of things and on the back of all the conversations we're having with the government, the conversations we would have had with the utilities, And hopefully by then as well, I mean, we've already started to have some very high level discussions about potential financing options as well, whether that be through equity, through debt or through a combination of both. We're not sure at this stage, but certainly those conversations have been starting to have. And then people can start to realize this is a real thing. These guys have got a relatively short amount of time to come back online again. There are low capex you know, requirements in terms of some of the other greenfield projects out there. They've made good advancements with the utilities, with the banks, with the investors and with the government as well. And they can see us as a serious company that's going to come online and produce uranium and sell it into the market in 2024. No, it's a a good point. Well well made, well understood. This isn't um, CapEx in the conventional sense. This is CapEx for a refurbishment of 200 million bucks, which was already spent prior to you guys coming along. So um, that's got to be quite advantageous in terms of margins, et cetera. Well, look, um, look Keith, let's, let, let's kind of park it there because I think, I think that's a really good um, summary and roundup of, of you know, what's ha- been happening and what you are go- just about to um, do. I'm not going to get you to kind of predict market price or uh, expected um, price that you're going to need to kind of get into incentive price to get into production or anything. I think that's, that's, um, that way madness lies. But interesting times should be an interesting six months. Uh, good luck with the conference and uh, stay in touch. Okay. Excellent. No, thank you very much.